Okay, so I will start the lecture or the, the, the talk with a statement. Uh, and, and actually, it's, it corresponds a bit to something I've been hearing a little bit at the conference about um, what is the perfect food, what is the perfect diet for the planet, uh, for yourself, for your own health. And I'll start just with this statement that actually there's no such thing as a perfect diet for everybody. Uh, and that we respond very, very differently to exactly the same food. Uh, and so what do I mean by respond? Everything from after you have a meal, how do you feel? How much energy do you have? Did you enjoy the meal? Uh, how fat did it make you? How much sugar did you get from it? All of these things are responses that we have to food. And the statement I want to start with is that we all respond extremely differently to the exact same food. The exact same ingredients prepared the same way, we respond differently. And you may already know this intuitively. You may have had uh, two friends who've tried the same trendy diet and they've responded differently. It worked for some and not for others. Uh, you may have tried a diet which your friend had tried, and, such as the keto diet, and it gave them lots of energy, it made them more productive at work, but for you, you were tired the whole time. So we sort of already know this in ourselves, that we respond differently um, uh, as individuals to the same diet. It's increasingly being quantified um, uh, scientifically that we do indeed respond differently. So this is a study from an Israeli group, one of the, the biggest. They had over 800 participants, and I won't go through the data, but I'll just show you um, some examples from their data to illustrate the point. So to them, the response was blood glucose. So how much sugar came into your blood after you ate something? And on the top, you have a single participant from the study. Up and down is the amount of sugar they got into their blood. And then side to side is, is time. So you have uh, one participant who had a, a sugar drink, and they got lots of glucose in their blood. And then they had bread on a different day, and they got less. And the two lines are replicate trials of the same food. On the bottom, you have a different participant with the same two ingredients, and you see that that person got much more sugar into their blood from bread than they did from glucose, the exact opposite of the participant above. So they responded totally differently to the same ingredients. Now, here's another example with, with sort of a mixed ingredient meal with cookies. So you have, you have uh, you've given these participants a banana, and then you've given them cookies, and you see this participant uh, in the study had a big sugar spike uh, from the banana, and this one from cookies, and they did it from the other diet. So these are different people eating the exact same ingredients, and they're responding totally differently. So there's no such thing as a perfect diet for these, for these people. And it's important beyond just losing weight and feeling good. Uh, it's important because it's incredibly medically relevant. So you have diet being linked to a huge range of diseases, particularly modern diseases, type 2 diabetes, uh, cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, cancer. These things are all rising, and more and more they're being associated with diet. And so if a, if, a, if a patient who's suffering from some disease comes to their physician and says, look, I, I'm having problems with, with uh, my digestion, I, I'm having irritable bowel, or I'm at risk for type 2 diabetes, if the physician makes a recommendation to that person for a particular diet based on averages from a population, it could be that they're giving the exact wrong advice to that person. Right? Uh, and so it's understanding the variation in how we respond individually to the same ingredients is, imp is really important for medically. Yeah. So our study system, uh, rather, than, rather than some other groups which focus on, 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 on mixed ingredient meals, uh, is, is lactose. Lactose, you probably are all familiar with, it's, it's in all dairy products, well, most dairy products, particularly milk, it's produced by all mammals uh, in breast milk. Uh, it's just a sugar, it's made of glucose and, and galactose. Uh, but it's interesting because there are a lot of known drivers of, how, of variants of how we respond to lactose. So we decided to focus in and look at human responses, and the variation in human response to lactose, and specifically ask, what drives variation in our response to lactose and, and, and milk? Okay. So to take a quick step back to just explain 
what is lactose intolerance, what is lactose. Uh, again, most of you have probably heard of, of lactose intolerance, but um, what most of you per perhaps don't know is, is that uh, it, it's across the whole mammalian kingdom. Uh, the only way that we can digest lactose is with an enzyme uh, produced by us as when we're babies. Yeah? All mammals do this, they produce lactase, it breaks the sugar apart into its single molecules, which, al which allows it to be taken up by the body. Uh, but in most humans, and in most mammals, that enzyme is turned off after we stop breastfeeding. So there was no reason, before we domesticated cattle, there was no reason to produce this enzyme as adults, because you never would have drinking milk, yeah? and, and, most, and most mammals as adult animals, they don't drink milk. Yeah? So it's only as infants that we drink milk. And so in most humans, this enzyme is turned off. It's very expensive to produce, so it's turned off. When it's off, and then you still consume lactase, or lactose, rather, it comes down into your large intestine, uh, it meets all the bacteria that lives there, uh, and that's fermented into gases, water comes in, you have diarrhea, you have abnormal pain, and all the symptoms associated with lactose intolerance. But what makes, what makes lactose so interesting from a biological perspective and from an evolutionary perspective is that some humans have evolved the ability to continue to produce this enzyme into adulthood. Yeah? And this was a, a direct response to our domestication of, of animals. And once we had this available resource, we evolved to produce lactase. And so in some humans, we continue to produce it, so there's clearly a genetic, there's a genetic effect here. And this is genetic lactose tolerance. So this is a map of, the gen of, of genetic lactose tolerance, right? So the way to look at this is the red colors, there are more people who have the gene uh, for, for lactose tolerance. So this would be the gene that when you send in your kit to 23andMe and it sends back and they say you're likely to be lactose tolerant, this is the same gene. And you see there's basically three hotspots, one in Europe, this is why I've included Scandinavian in the presentation talk, uh, and one in Africa, and, and one in India and, and the Middle East. And so these are all people who have long histories of animal domestication, and they're hotspots for the genetic component of lactose tolerance. So we know, when we come back to our question, what drives variation in our response to dairy and to lactose, we know that a big component of it is genetic. And we've known this for a long time, that's nothing new. But when I first started, when I first started at the Max Planck, we knew we had, we had seen some, from some papers and we had known anecdotally that it's clearly not the only part of the answer. Something else is going on. And it becomes clear when you look at maps like this. This is India as an example. On the left, you have actual tolerance. So these are, the black dots are studies that have gone to the ground, have gone onto the ground in India and given people milk or given people lactose and measured their response. How did they feel? How much gas did they produce after they had the dose, yeah? And then on the right is just a genetic map from your 23andMe, uh, are you lactose tolerant? And what you see is a really, really poor correlation. Uh, and not only that, a poor cor overall correlation of where the hotspots are, but also a, 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 a much more of this actual tolerance uh, than you have of genetic tolerance. So when we saw this, we said, well, it's, it's clear to us that, that there's still a lot to learn about what's driving our response to lactose tolerance. There's, there's something else going on. <clears throat> of course, I come from the Department of Microbiome Sciences, so you might have guessed that part of the answer may be the microbiome. So in the introduction, we heard a little bit about what the microbiome is, um, but it's the sum of microbes associated with the host. Yeah? So this is all the bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungus. It's in your stomach, it's in your gut, it's in your eyes, it's in your ear, it's everywhere. We have these ecosystems of microbes living on and in us. If you gather all of these microbes together and weigh them up, they weigh about the same as your heart. So it's, it's really an, an organ that uh, lives inside of us. And we think it, it helps to explain some of the variants in, in how we respond to different foods. And most of you also have, if you're interested in the microbiome, you may have seen graphs like this where diet impacts the microbiota, which in turn impacts host metabolism. Uh, and so there's this, there's this connection between all three. So when we saw this, we knew that there was this disconnect between the, what the genetics were supposed to be predicting and what we saw on the ground in actual tolerance. 
And so we went to three places around the world. We went to Vietnam, Gabon, and Germany, where we knew there would be different rates of genetic tolerance. And we said, can we find tolerant, intolerant people? And so there's right, we tolerant, intolerant people. So can we find people who have no genetic background for lactose tolerance, but consume dairy all the time and drink milk as part of their culture, and they have no side effects? So people whose tolerance is unexplained. Uh, and so we chose these places because we thought we might find them there. So we, as I say, we went to these, these three spots. And in each spot, we measured two metrics of lactose tolerance. We measured blood glucose, as I showed in the beginning, so how much um, sugar you get after drinking, uh, and then gas production from the breath. So does the lactose go down to the large intestine and get fermented by bacteria and turn into gas? We measured those two. Uh, and then we also selected for a range of developmental um, uh, uh, sort of statuses in each, in each country, so rural and urban areas, to try and control for uh, exposure to dairy. So I'll show you this. Uh, it's not meant to take away the exact data, but, but uh, basically th these are the, the data from the Europeans that we sampled, mostly of German descent. Yeah. So up and down again is the number of study participants um, that, and then, then side to side on the left is their blood sugar response and on the right is their gas response. So right away you see huge variance, right? There was a lot of difference in how people responded. But Germans on the whole had about 25 milligrams per deciliter increase in blood sugar after a standardized dose of lactose, right? But quite a wide distribution. But mostly they had a large intake of sugar after, the, after milk, yeah? into the blood, but almost no gas production. Right? So here's zero uh, hydrogen production, and most people straddled that zero line, most of the Europeans. Now you plot over the Africans. Uh, these were people um, of African descent, both living in Europe and living in Africa. And you see that they have uh, no uh, uh, blood glucose. Now we expected this from, from the genetics. But what we didn't expect was that nearly 20% of them also produced no gas. And then people of East Asian descent, we saw the same thing uh, with the gas production, even more of a shift on the blood glucose and a wide distribution on gas production. So we use those two metrics to classify people uh, basically into bins. And so we can, we can classify them as, as, as standard lactose tolerant. And you see most Europeans are lactose tolerant, um, although quite a few intolerant. And then this new group, uh, which we term acquired tolerant. So these are the people, again, with no genetic predisposition, but show no signs of intolerance. And we found that about 20% of genetically intolerant people are this sort of new category of lactose tolerance. Uh, and that they, they are perfectly capable uh, of, of having high doses of lactose, even though they have no genetic predisposition to do so. And we, we're, we're uh, thinking this is, this is likely due to the microbiome. So uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you that this is the exact thing in the microbiome which confers that tolerance. I wish I could tell you that, and we're working hard on that uh, as we speak. We're trying to determine which part of the microbiome, which genes, which enzymes in the microbiome are conferring lactose tolerance in these 20%. We don't know yet. We do know that there's huge variation in the microbiome from site to site, so each point is a participant, and the distance between the points is how different their microbiomes are, and then they're colored by the place in which they're sampled. Yeah? Or, uh, sorry, they're colored by the, by the, by the ethnicity of the participant. So you see Germans, Vietnamese, and Gabonese are all very different in their microbiomes. And just anecdotally, the red circles are my own microbiome as I was traveling into each of these places. So you see quite a lot of plasticity in how your microbiome changes as you travel. And you really become like the place in which you're living. Um, and so, and, and currently now what we're doing is we're moving uh, into the lab. So we're starting to put uh, these microbiomes from each of the different categories of participants into mice, which have no microbiome themselves, and see if we can, if we can make them lactose tolerant. See if we can give mice the ability to digest different food types by giving them different types of microbiomes. Uh, and so we're, we're actively um, working on that now. 
Uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank all of our, our collaborators and, and, and to the hosts uh, for, for inviting me um, and happy to take any questions.